Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week we're going to be broaching the pulley halves for the big variable speed drive unit on the do all saw. Also make a brazing fixture because I got to fix I got to fix a couple handles. We'll do one in this video uh, from a big Monarch lathe that a friend of mine has that's broken. So we make a fixture, we'll braze it up. It turns out pretty good. You'll see. I enjoyed it. Hopefully you will too. So thanks for watching guys. Let's get started. So all that's left to do to our pulley halves here is broach our new keyways in. Now the idea here, at least my thoughts behind this, is I'm not for sure that these pulleys were balanced individually or as all in one unit, you know, one rotating mass. But if they were, what I'm going to do is on the same, I'm going to do the same on each pulley half. Clock my new keyway 90 degrees off the original and I'm going to try to keep these the same. That way you know, they rotate the same in relationship to each other as they did from the factory. That's kind of the thought anyway. So let's go over to the press. Hopefully this will fit. That's awful long brooch. I don't know. We'll see. But that's all these need and then they're done. And we can slide them on the, on the center hub here. Alright, so we went through one time, you know, I just pushed it through a little, then I put my base plate on. Just to keep everything square, because it kind of wants to, if you're not pushing square on the brooch, it wants to bind. So I'm just using a little extreme pressure lube on these brooch bushings. This is my first bushing that I'm putting in. Just increases the depth that the, this brooch cuts, just pushes it out into the work more. And the longer the keyway, the more pressure it takes to push these through. It's quite a bit, really. So to get the keyway to the depth that you need or want, it comes with brooch sets. Usually come with shims, but most of the time you gotta make your own to get to the to the depth that you need. This is just a piece of what twenty three thousandths, I think, feeler gauge. This should get me exactly what I need. At least I hope that's the case. And all they do is you know stack up behind the brooch here. You just keep pushing it through, adding shims till you get the depth that you want. Pretty simple. There's our new keyway. Slide the hub down in here. And it fits just just enough clearance for it to slide down in there. And it should keep that Woodruff key held down in its seat. It shouldn't be able to come out of there. So that's uh, that's the idea. Let me get you a little closer on it. You can see it just just enough to fit in there. You know, good 
a good tight fit. That's what I wanted. So there we go, all together and pretty much done. You can see we've got two places for belts to run. And as one, you know, as this pulley half moves over, it makes the belt run out larger on this pulley while you know, simultaneously making this one run down deeper. And that's how you change the speeds because this is on a big pivoting bracket, which I've yet to clean up. But you get the idea. This just floats on this uh, hub in the center. That's it. All right, so on my bench here in this box is some broken handles off of a large Monarch lathe that a friend of mine's restoring. His name's James Kuna. He's also got a YouTube channel called The Engineer's Workshop, so go check him out. But anyway, he's trying to restore this old lathe that he had bought that at some point in its life had been knocked over during a move and broken some of the handles on it. So these are cast iron, and he'd seen me repair cast iron in the past and asked me if I'd be interested. So I said, sure, send them. So let me get you in here. We will open this box up together, see what we have as far as a repair, and uh, you know, see what we can do to get him back at least closer to making chips. I know that you know, he's in the process of restoring this thing, so let's see if we can help him out. Faster. The lid wasn't going to fall off this. Better overpacked than underpacked. Now, I don't know if you've ever made this, uh, you know, connection before, but a lathe and a piece of buttered bread have a lot in common. If you drop a piece of bread that has butter on it, it will always fall butter side down. Well, a lathe will always fall operator side down, where all the handles and stuff are. You know, the important stuff that can get broken. That's just the way the world works. Anyway, so here's what we have. Um, very well packed, you know, organized. He had also sent a drawing with this. Now, I would opened this a while back, but and obviously misplaced the drawing. I'll have to find that, but let's see what we have here. As far as parts to repair, I believe one this is a piece for a taper attachment, I believe. So we got a nice clean break there, pretty clean anyway. Uh, that we'll have to fix. That may be kind of tricky to get held together and kept straight. We'll see. We'll look at it a little closer. And then we've got a gear shift lever, looks like here. Pretty important pieces, you know. You can't just hack this stuff together. You really needs repaired at least to where it looks like it's not ever been broken. That's my idea anyway. This is a piece that's uh, for reference, I believe. And um, I think that's it. And a piece of cast iron. There's a thread, so it's got to be threaded like that. Okay, that's got to go here. So this is broken here. Here's the piece of cast iron to remake that part there. It's got to look like this when it's done. And then we got to put this piece together here. So let's get these out. Let's think about what we're going to do a little bit. Man, that's a nice packing job. That'll make it nice for the return shipping. But anyway, let me look at this stuff a little closer. We'll develop a plan and uh, go from there. All right, so let's start off with what I think will be the easiest repair out of the two. The easiest one of the two. This looks like it was broken off this way. It's a little, maybe a little bent that we'll have to account for but it keys together nice it's a good clean break which makes things good because you can you know keep everything lined up this is also has flats here and here that are on different levels but they're still on the same plane so that'll help us when we go to fixture this up but we need to get these pins out these dowel pins out in order for this to set flat on whatever fixture we're going to make so i need to get these out i'm going to just use this little bench block here Drive these pins out. 
and we'll have to come up with some, you know, something to use for a fixture. Those are nice. Alright, so I got to looking at this piece, and not only is it broken here, but it's been broken at one point right here. It's kind of hard to tell, but you can see that's a, you know, it's got a bronze bushing in here, but that's brass or bronze uh, filler right here. So this whole chunk, this upper section here, has been broken out at one point or another. And somebody's went in here and put a new bushing in it. This one's got a partial threaded hole in it. They didn't do that from the factory. And uh, you can see it looks like it's got hammer marks and stuff here, which are just voids from uh, from brazen, just places that didn't fill in good. So not this handle's first run in with a uh, forklift or the ground, but it uh, looks like a good repair. So still uh, getting distracted here. Let's focus on, uh, on the task at hand. All right, so I've got my part here clamped to a plate that I'm going to use as a fixture. And I need to transfer these two holes onto the plate so I can put a couple bolts you know, down through here to hold it all together. And instead of using a set of transfer punches like this, this side, the kind that we're all common with, you know, these are just in a different, a bunch of different size ranges. I have a set of tr expanding transfer punches. If I can get them open, they're made by the Kelly Tool Company. This case is. Not cooperating. There we go. Anyway, it's a set of three. These are made in Alhambra, California. And it's just a set of three, which almost takes the place of this entire set here and would fit in your shirt pocket. But what these do, differently from, from those, is that, of course, they expand. So you put it down in the hole. You expand it till it's tight. And then it has a punch that you strike with a hammer and it marks the center of your hole. So it's a pretty neat set. Some of you guys who've been with the channel for a long time will have seen me show those. But that's been you know, years ago. So share them so you just put it to the very bottom of the hole where it sets square. Tighten it up. And then strike the little punch there. It doesn't take much. You ain't got a beat on your punches. So you get the idea. Pretty neat little tool that you don't see very often, at least I haven't. So these big Starrett wall charts are really nice. And I know a couple of years ago I got on Starrett's website, filled out a little bit of information, and they shipped me out this wall chart and some decimal equivalent cards. Basically the same information that's on these little cards is on the big one, free of charge. So if you're interested, go check them out, both Imperial and Metric. And, uh, you know, you can drill, you can pick your drills for tapping at a glance. So it's really nice to have. So go check them out if you're interested. Here in the U.S., quarter 20, the size, thread pitch, is a really commonly used size, and most people can pick them out of a drawer by eye without even looking at the size. And this is just my quick grab tap drawer metric in Imperial. But anyway, this is one that I had saved. I thought it was definitely an oddity. It's labeled quarter 20, which you probably can't see, but, uh, you know, you talk about throwing you off balance when you... <laughs> such a known size, and then you... You know, look at that and you're like, what? That's not quarter 20. And it's actually 5 sixteenths 20. So I thought that was strange and an oddity. A mislabeled tap, which I have ran into a few times. But every time I do, you know, it's like, it feels strange. So I just thought I'd share that with you. So, you know, it does happen. They, uh, they get mislabeled like anything else will. Strange if nothing else. Alright, so the reason I'm building a, you know, just a fixture plate for 
for this setup is simply because I don't want it to warp when I go to braise it out. This is a fairly thick piece and I'm gonna you know try to get hundred percent penetration with this brazing alloy and you know try to give this as much strength as I can and if I don't have something to hold this in line it's just gonna warp and when I get done it'll be all crooked and it just won't be a good job so you know I'm not gonna spend any more time on this little fixture than I have to but to assure I get a decent job you know, it's gonna take a little extra effort other than you know sticking that on the welding bench and you know, just trying to do it freehand All right, so I'm looking at this as far as its alignment, and to me, it looks like it's slightly bent. You probably can't really tell on the camera, but it, to, to me, it looks like it's bent a little you know, that way. So I'm going to just go with my gut feeling on this because there is no real way to align this. There's no, there's only machine surfaces on it, or the flats that it's sitting on there and and there. You have a square surface there, but what do you square that up against? It's a casting. So I'm going to use my best judgment. Got a transfer punch here, fits the hole, and I'm just going to use my eye and line this thing up as best as I think that it should be. I think it got bent slightly when uh, you know, when it got broke. So you can get stuff pretty close by. There we go. Just need to drill a hole there, and then you know come up with a spacer. So I'm using the always handy little stair adjustable parallels to get me set up here. I'm going to have to clamp this to this plate in order to hold it when I burr this out and braise it up to keep it from warping. So to determine the size spacers that I need, I just kind of got everything lined up and set up with these parallels so I can take these out then I can cut blocks to that size and then clamp this thing together. This little front parallel here also makes sure that I stay parallel with this surface here in the plate and allows me to adjust it up till I get the size that I need to keep everything in line. You get the idea. I think that will work pretty well. So let's go over to the shaper. I'm just going to use it on the shaper simply because the other side of the shop is so cold you know, the grinder may not even start. So let's just do this on the shaper. Make us a couple blocks and Bob's your uncle. So this being an older type shaper vise without the jaw like your modern milling vices that pulls down as you tighten these jaws will lift so you have to take a little extra care getting set up in a vise like this the older style and if you're doing like just one part and you can place it directly over the lead screw that's the best place to put it the screw that tightens the vise that way your jaw doesn't cant and you get a good secure hold on your part so when you go to put something in a vise like this and you tighten it up It'll lift off the back parallel, so you got to make sure to tap your part down real well. Tighten progressively. That way, everything stays good and square. And, you know, no reason to over tighten anything in a vise. Tight enough to hold it is tight enough. Anything more than that you know, just adds more distortion to the part. You know, this part's not going anywhere, it's not even critical. I just thought that was a good example. You've got to take a little more time with these older, uh, less uh, modern vices.
So I'm just using a long pulley tap so I can clear my uh, clamp here. Tapping this 3816 for the clamp that I'm going to use to hold this all together and in line. I don't want to use one of my C-clamps on it because it's going to get so hot that it uh, could potentially damage it. I'm not interested in that. I'm just going to tap this out and uh, put me some threaded rods in here. So the fixture is complete. Something like this adds some time to the repair initially, but if you have to cut this thing apart once, twice, because you braze it up crooked the first time, you didn't save any time at all by not making something like this. It's just some insurance, that's all. Just made out of scrap. Probably took, I don't know, 45 minutes maybe to drill a few holes and tap it. You get the idea. That should hold us good and true. Now it's time to come in here, hog some of this out, and braze it up. So this is kind of one of those jobs where you could probably make the whole thing over for about the same amount of time and effort as it does to go through all the jazz that I've went through already. I guess the only benefit to this is that you are using the original part over. Which is good, I guess. And I really want to get me one of those nice, heavy-duty, big, electric motor-powered, wand-driven grinders. I think those are nice. So I'm about ready to get started brazing this up. I'm about 99% through. I left a little shelf at the bottom so I can have something to lay my alloy on and then build off of that. Just makes it easier for me. Using eutectic rods, these are pre-coated rods that were given to me by a viewer of the channel some time ago, Peter Ramio. And uh, I always like to scrape the flux off of them and use my own. This is Forney Premium Brazing Flux. It's borax is what it is, basically works really well. I'm going to preheat this thing because it's cheaper with propane. You know, get some heat into it and then come back at the end and put the real heat in with oxygen and acetylene. But I'm running low on oxyacetylene, so I always like to, you know, use propane just to get things close to temp. So let's get started on this. It should go pretty quick once I get this thing hot. Alright, so I switched over to oxygen and acetylene, and I'm uh, really getting close. These things got to be real hot in order to braze them together. I always get asked why I use a, a cutting head for brazing. It's pretty simple. It's because it's what I got. I don't have a full set of uh, brazing tips for this torch. And these, this works. Not ideal, but it does work. So 
this fixture is kind of acting like a heat sink. I always like to get some brazing alloy on all my sharp edges. Otherwise, you know, they heat up and you don't get a good bond. Once you get hot, there's like a sweet spot where you're right on the edge of too hot and not hot enough. And that's kind of where I like to dance. Raising is one of those things that's kind of hard to explain in words. It's one of those jobs you just gotta kind of learn to do on your own through practice. But if I was going to give anybody some advice, you know, beginner advice, that's kind of what I consider myself, is to heat your part up slow. Try not to overheat the sharp edges, the corners, stuff like that. Apply more flux than you think that you need. Add your brazing alloy to those sharp edges and corners first. That way you can you know, assure that you're going to get a good bonding between the two pieces. Wet both sides of your part that you're going to bond. Kind of like you would, I guess, if you were soldering some wires together. You know, build your alloy up slow. Wetting the surface. Adding a little at a time until you get the size and shape bead that you want. You know, that's kind of the way I do it. It works for me. But, uh, it, you know, it took a while to learn to, to get this alloy not to just run completely off the part. Heat control, I think, is probably one of your tougher things to do. Alright, so I think that's about as good as that's going to be. There we go. Looks okay. It's not perfect. They never are. Alright, so I need to get some insulation in here and cover this thing up real quick. I don't want it to cool too fast. But I'm happy with the repair. If it was mine, I'd be pleased with that. Probably at least 90% penetration. You know, as much material holding it together now as there was originally. That's kind of what it looks like. Pretty good. There's just not a great way other than this, in my opinion, to repair cast iron. So much carbon in it. There are other ways, but brazing works well. And this should hold for its original intention from now on. It should be plenty strong, you know, as long as this thing doesn't fall over again. So there you go. We'll let it cool down and we'll clean it up. Well, it's cooled down enough now to where I can get it off of this fixture and start cleaning it up. These are the glasses that I use. These are made by Remington. You know, the ones that we're all used to. The big goggles with the elastic band on them that is no longer elastic. The ones that are hanging on your welding cart and they're hanging upside down full of dirt and dust. Throw those in the trash and get you a set of, you know, they need to be rated for oxygen and acetylene use, but get you a set of something like this. They're so much better. go. It's pretty good. Get some of that uh, flux chipped off of it and uh, burr down that excess. That's done.
So we've got the pins back in it, the register pins. It really stayed nice and parallel. I checked it on the plate, just laid it down, checked this surface and this surface, and they're you know, close as they need to be. So you wouldn't know that was ever broke. Well, you would, but nobody else that looks at it would once it's painted. Perfectly strong, I'm sure. Here's where I joined, or where my bridge was. It was still a little crack there, but I mean, it's like the goes about as deep as the thickness of a razor blade, probably 40 thousandths or so. That's what I built off of. You know, the little shelf that I set all this on and then kept building up and building up until I got to what you see there. Well guys, I think that's it. I'm really happy with the way that turned out. I'm, I don't regret at all making the fixture. It's sometimes the few extra steps that you take to assure that a job comes out right the first time you know, is worth it. And in this case it was, because I can't imagine trying to, you know, hold that and braise it or stack up blocks or something. My luck, it would get knocked off and, you know, there you'd go. You'd be wasting your time. So, you know, coming out right the first time is always a plus. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do on this thing yet. I haven't gave it a lot of thought. You know, I've just kind of started planning something out. We'll see. I don't know. It'll probably involve another fixture itself. But that's an important piece. So it needs to be right. So thanks for watching. Thanks to my viewers, my patrons, and subscribers. I couldn't and wouldn't do it without you. Click on my little guy to subscribe to the channel if you haven't. It's always nice to see the channel grow. And I think that's it. So thanks for watching, guys. Send me an email if you need anything. See you next time.